So according to your TA Indiana, the number one mistake that students would make on this rocket problem is to use the rocket equation. The Solkovsky rocket equation does not work for rocket problems on Earth. Students want to use it because it looks so easy and you have all of the information you need, like mass and exit velocity, it looks perfect. But there's an assumption for using this rocket equation and that's that there's no external forces being applied. So this equation can only be used in outer space where there's no gravity and no drag. But for a rocket taking off from a launch pad here on Earth, you might be able to get away with ignoring drag for a homework problem, but definitely not gravity. So in your fluid mechanics class, rocket problems are momentum problems, not rocket problems. So I'm gonna label my concept as momentum with an accelerating control volume. That is, as the rocket goes upwards, it will be accelerating due to all of the mass that it's expelling. Every momentum problem starts off exactly the same way, by drawing a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram, and you set those equal to each other to write your equation of equilibrium. On your free body diagram, you've got all of your external forces of which I'm going to write weight, the weight of the rocket. The kinetic diagram is where you put all of your changes in momentum. This is either ma or m dot v, because linear momentum is mass times velocity, so change in momentum is the derivative of either of those terms, either m dot or v dot. So the rocket is moving upwards, so I have my ma term pointing up, and then my m dot v is exiting the control volume downwards. That's where the fuel is being expelled downwards. Now for completion, I'm gonna write another external force on my free body diagram, and that's fd, drag force. But I'm going to simplify the problem and just call this drag force zero because this is a momentum problem, not a drag problem. In your fluid mechanics course, you might not even gotten to the drag section yet. So for a real rocket analysis, I would definitely want to include drag. But for this problem, I'm not given any information about the aerodynamic shape of the rocket. So I'm just going to assume drag is zero and just consider this just a regular momentum problem with weight as the only external force. So my equilibrium equation is all of the forces for my free body diagram on the left side, so negative drag and negative weight. And then on the right side is all of my changes in momentum, so positive ma because it's upwards. And for my m dot v, the m dot term is positive because the mass is leaving the control volume, and the velocity term is negative because it's pointed downwards. So m dot v ends up being negative. So cross off drag, because I ignored that, assumed it was zero. And now comes the second thing that most students would get wrong on this problem. If you made it past the first hurdle and didn't use the rocket equation, you gotta get past this next one too. The second most common mistake would be for students to assume that acceleration is constant. You really, really want to do that because you're given an initial speed to final speed of zero to 500, and you're given a time of 30 seconds, so you want to just divide 500 divided by 30 and give yourself a constant acceleration. But that's not reality. And you know that that can't be true because mass is changing. Initially, the rocket is carrying a ton of fuel, so it's really heavy, so it will accelerate really slowly. But over time, as fuel is expended, the rocket is getting lighter. And so the same amount of force is being applied because the mass flow rate will be constant, the same amount of force will result in a faster acceleration once the rocket becomes lighter. So if terms are going to be changing in time, that's your cue that this is gonna be a calculus problem. Things that are time dependent, it involves derivatives and integrals. So we need to start rewriting the equation in a way that's gonna look like a calculus equation because that'll help us figure out how to solve it. So first, our acceleration term, I will rewrite as dv dt. Now m dot, that's gonna be the final answer we're looking for, and the problem statement told us that that was constant. The exit velocity is constant, that's 3,000. Gravity is a constant, 9.81. And m is actually a term that's changing. So I'm gonna put here, this is m parentheses t, like m as a function of time. This is not mass times time, it's not multiplication, it's mass as a function of time. So with this dv dt, this tells me that I'm gonna get out of this problem by integrating, right? That's how I get rid of the differential terms. 
So my first goal to setting up a way to solve this is gonna to be to try to isolate dV dt by itself so that I can multiply dt to the other side and get basically a differential term on each side, which is gonna help me set up two integrals. So I start off by adding m dot v to move that over to the left. And then I divide by mass to get dV dt by itself. Multiply dt over to the right hand side. And now you can see that this is set up looking like two integrals. One is gonna be an integral with respect to time, one an integral with respect to velocity. Now I am gonna separate the subtraction term. So my left hand side, I'll split to two separate integrals, one with my mass flow rate, and then one with my gravity. And then to make the integrals as easy as possible, I'm gonna pull out everything that is a constant, I'm gonna pull outside of the integrals because those are just coefficients, they're just numbers. Since m is a function of time, before I can do this integral of one over m, I need to actually replace it with t, right? I need to get time into this time derivative. So the mass of the rocket is gonna be the initial mass, the 21,500, that's the rocket plus all the fuel, minus m dot t, the burn rate of fuel times time. So minus the amount of fuel that has already been expelled. So now I will rewrite my integrals using time now in my integral and I'll plug in like the, the 3000 and 9.81, the other numbers that I already know. Cause that'll help remind me that these are just numbers and not variables. The problem looks a little bit less scary sometimes when there's numbers in it instead of letters. So I guess working right to left, the integral of dv is like the integral of one dv. And the integral of one is just v when it's a integral with respect to v. And so velocity is going from zero to 500. So those are my bounds of integration were my initial and final velocity. For the 9.81 integral of dt, that's the integral of one dt. So the integral of one is just t when it's an integral with respect to time. And now the bounds of integration for time were from zero to 30, the 30 seconds being the maximum time. And so now the integral of the one over 21,500, so the integral of one over t would be natural log of t. The integral of one over a function of t is gonna be natural log of that function, but because of the chain rule, will also be multiplied by one divided by the integral of the inside part of that parentheses. So that's why I have a one over negative m dot in front. And let's, and we can double check this by taking the derivative of this term to make sure we get back what we started with. So this isn't a product rule because m dot is a constant, right? That's just a number, it's a coefficient, not a variable. So the derivative of natural log is one over everything in parentheses, so that's the 21,500 minus m dot t. But then because of chain rule, you'd also have to take the derivative of the inside, so you would multiply by negative m dot, which is the coefficient in front of time. So multiplying by negative m dot gets canceled out by that one over negative m dot that we had out front. So yes, check mark, this actually is the correct integral because when we differentiate it, we get back the thing we started with. So it's just moving on with some algebra here. The uh, m dot in front next to the 3000 cancels this m dot that's in the denominator. We've got bounds zero to 30. So we plug in 30 and then subtract the same expression again, natural log, but with plugged in zero for time. And then we've got 9.81 times 30, and then we've got 500 over on the right-hand side. So the m dot times zero term is gonna go away. So we just have one variable left in this equation, just one m dot term. It's not immediately obvious how to isolate it, but if we can just rearrange to solve for this term, that's the end of the problem. We're, we're like in the home stretch, we're almost there. So I'm gonna move the 9.81 times 30 over to the right-hand side and combine it with the 500. I'll take my natural log of 21,500 to convert that into just a regular number. So the 3,000 is outside the parentheses, so I can just divide it over to the right-hand side. Once the 3,000's gone, I can take the 9.97 and add that over to the other side and get the natural log by itself on the left-hand side. You need the natural log by itself to get rid of it using an exponent. So e to the natural log cancels both of those out and leaves just the inside left. And once we combine everything on the right side, we've got e to the 9.7, which again, that's some calculator work, about 16,000. 
So now this is finally looking like a regular equation, 21,500 minus m dot t equals 16,000, subtract, divide, we get a mass flow rate of 166.7 kilograms per second. And so does that answer make sense? There's a lot of calculus involved, calculator work, there are a lot of opportunities to make a math error along the way. And so the easiest way to figure out whether this answer makes sense is just to look at the size. Does it make sense that this much fuel could have been spent in 30 seconds? So 166.7 kilograms per second times 30 seconds is 5,000 kilograms of fuel. So since we started with 6,500 kilograms, if we had got an answer more than 6,500, we would know that that's impossible because we only had 6,500. We can't burn 7,000 kilograms if we only started with 6,500. So since 5,000 is less than the amount that we started with, but it's on the same order of magnitude, this doesn't guarantee that our answer is correct, but it at least is definitely within the realm of viable. It's a reasonable amount. And so if any mistakes were made, at least they were small ones. So if you're ready for another fluid mechanics momentum problem, but you don't want to do any more calculus right now, you want to give your brain a little bit of a break, go ahead and click on the video on the screen here.